I do want to acknowledge, <coughs> though, that um, the format we've given you is a bit of a challenging format, and it's maybe not culturally appropriate, really, as well. The reason why we have these, these um, relatively quickly spaced talks is because at previous workshops, people really enjoyed them. And I think it's kind of uh, working as well. We have two more speakers to get to uh, here in the first session. Um, but I do want to acknowledge, and I really appreciate you um, bringing your, your perspective to us in this, in this short time frame. There's so much more we'd probably like to hear from you. Uh, from from all of you, um, and um, you know the the kind of university you built. There's actually there's actually like a, an actual university that's there, and the kind of um, institutional innovation that had to go into building this. And how do you set this up? Do the normal processes that we have do they actually work in that context? Do you need to set up courses differently? Do you have like different learning uh, prerequisites? Do you deal with that differently? There's there's a whole bunch of, of things that go into creating that. And what actually is happening in, in that university? You didn't even mention that part. <laughs> is that um, you actually got everybody else to come to the university as well as well because the quality was just there. So when you create that kind of environment, when you're actually inclusive and you bring everybody in, you actually create a good learning space, not just for Maori, um, but you actually create a good learning space for everybody. And I think that's, um, you know, that's one of the lessons I, I, I'm also taking away from, from our conversations before. So with that, I'd like to um, come back to Canada. <laughs> um, and uh, Jacques actually um, from Kingston, I think he came, came up from Kingston okay. right now. Trenton. So from Trenton, all right, somewhere around here, but Eastern Ontario in general. So, um, so he came a ways, but, but not quite as far. Um, uh, I'd like to ask you to come up and uh, tell us about uh, your perspective from uh, your neck of the woods. How am I gonna get this to move, move forward? Right Just click right there, okay. Should know how to do this. Oh, can everybody hear me? Great, thanks. Well, first, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Sandra and uh, the IS ISSP for inviting me to speak here today. And I'd also like to thank uh, Guy Doncos for suggesting that I speak. It's a, it's a great opportunity. Uh, my name, as you can see up there, is uh, Jacques Pilon, and EIR stands for Entrepreneur in Residence. I uh, work with the Innovation Center in Kingston, and I have for more than five years. Uh, I've got a degree in physics, and for a change, I'm not the only guy in the room that has a degree in physics. I think Dr. Sharber, no, you have <laughs> And I've worked in many technical roles uh, over the years. And with Launch Lab, I get to meet um, all kinds of innovators with new tech-based products and services. Um, most of them want me to find them funding so that they can try and build a business by themselves. That's the typical scenario. They show up with something um, and they, they don't have any skills. They don't have a very good understanding of the importance of finance or sales or marketing. And most of them would fail. It wouldn't matter how much money you'd give them. Um, to kind of set the the tone for this, uh, I'd say that after five years, I can tell you that the path to success uh, comes easier from innovating in finance and or marketing, and most importantly, through collaboration with others. So keep that in mind. Uh, what I have for you today are real business examples of indigenous and non-indigenous entrepreneurs respecting and trusting each other enough to innovate and create wealth together. Most of them are women. Um, since I'm, this is presentation is new and I'm bound by an NDA, so I had to change some of the names and or actually kind of leave some of the names out. Uh, we'll dis I'm discussing the marketing opportunity of including those names later, but I haven't got the go ahead. So the first business I want to talk about is a health and beauty manufacturer, retailer, uh, located on a First Nations territory. Uh, the product is similar to what, what you see there, Burt's Bees, only it's got, um, and it's got indigenous knowledge included into it. It's wax-based, there's, there's uh, other ingredients that go in. 
making it different from Burt's Bees. The problem that the entrepreneur who created these products had was she was running into resistance from First Nations on territory retailers, mostly men, selling gasoline and tobacco products. She wanted to get her products into their stores. Uh, they, did, they didn't want a beauty product uh, on their shelves. They didn't want to make space for it. Uh, her marketing in innovation was to design attractive, uh, professional-looking display units of various sizes so she could incorporate those products into the counter space in these gasoline and, and uh, cigarette retail outlets. Um, the retailers embraced it. She also introduced a I consider like a bit of a financial innovation that she fronted the product to, to key retailers to get it in the store. She kept the display units stocked and she had quite a bit of success with the product. I, haven't, I have to catch up with her and find out where, where she's got the product now. So I actually checked that yesterday morning uh, and there is a smoke and gas depot. I made that up. Uh, but there really is a smoke and gas depot on one of the territories. Uh, the next business is Indigenous filmmaking, located in downtown Toronto. Um, the problem that Indigenous filmmaker M Maddie was having uh, was that she had created a uh, short film uh, featuring on-reserve Indigenous youth talking about experiences with their friends' suicide. Uh, the message needed to get out, but it's only a 20-minute film. It's hard to sell an event with 20 minutes with a film. That's the, that's the uh, slide for the film. Her innovation was to find a non-government sponsor, reach out through social media to find other female Indigenous film producers, extend the invitation to present their films in downtown Toronto in an Indigenous film evening. Uh, travel was arranged for Indigenous directors. Some of them were coming from the north. Maddie branded it. Power and Power, Indigenous Women in Film. She's using the brand for other things now. I think that pretty much covers product, marketing, financial, inclusive innovation. She kind of checks all the boxes. The evening was a success and Maddie later showed her film and was a presenter at the World Indigenous Suicide Prevention Conference in Australia. And she's an organizer this year for the upcoming conference, I believe it's in Winnipeg. My next reserve is a bit more, um, pardon me, my next example is a little bit more complicated. Um, We'll start with this. It takes pl um, the business opportunity takes place north of Superior on a reserve drive-in. If you don't know what drive-in means, somebody in the room will tell you. <laughs> <laughs> the product. <laughs> you think that's funny? You get that. <laughs> the product, Internet Access, IPTV, Voice over IP. Problem, problem one is small internet access providers have difficulty developing new markets because it's very expensive to not only install and market to new customers, but it's expensive to vet these new customers and build a workable relationship with them so that they can pay their bills reliably on time or with gaps in it, and you know that you're going to get paid. Like a second problem was that there was a First Nation Reserve with poor internet access. The innovation? Well, after the regional telecom provider delivered gigabit ethernet and the roads, the roads in the map are ribbons of fiber optic cable. Just think of them that way. They're ribbons of fiber owned by the incumbent service providers of Canada, Bell Canada, Rogers, maybe TELUS. You can you can connect links to that ribbon. Some of the ribbons are bells, some of the ribbons are independent ones. So the regional telecom provider gets the fiber to the reserve 
maybe through resale or building part of it themselves by trenching it in. They set up the wireless last mile distribution for internet access on the reserve. And then they helped set up customer care, billing, and other needed services on the reserve. The reserve successfully launches their own branded community telecom company, which sells internet access and all these other products, voice and um, IPTV on the reserve and off the reserve. Because the, while it's wireless, you can spread it out a little further. So there's a fringe area that they deliver services to. It's, okay, okay. there's one more. It looks kind of like that. Lots of little towers. It's easy to see the kind of the inclusive marketing innovation by splitting up these two roles, trusting each other. Um, but it's also partly a financial innovation because, and I, I'm repeating myself, it solves a lot of the receivable issues since the service provider is not seen as a big faceless telecom provider. This story goes on. It, the regional telecom providers now um, quoting more services similar to this one with other reserves. Uh, they're still driving. Can't solve the other problems <laughs> that easily. <laughs> uh, but there is one problem for the regional telecom provider that they, there's a taxation issue since they don't charge taxes to HST to, to the reserves, throws her ratios off with CRA, eventually CRA will want to know why. You might attract an audit. So it's actually a disincentive to, and from that respect, to do business with First Nations. And I thought I'd throw that one in. There's only in Canada, there's problems in the north with our telecom towers. They can get kind of icy. My last example is a little bit more personal. Um, the location is La Fontaine, Ontario. The business would be real estate speculation. Uh, the innovation, I would consider it using math to overcome prejudice. Uh, born in 1906, Alda had 11 siblings and grew up in a small French Métis community. She became a school teacher while she was still a teenager. She's good at math, and later she worked in an accounting position uh, for a 100-employee factory. Her husband, Isaac, was fine with having her, you know, having her have her own bank accounts at a time when women, let alone indigenous women, uh, rarely managed their own money. So this picture showed up on social media recently, and Elda is front row, I'm sorry it might not be that clear, but she's front and row center, probably sitting next to the owner of the factory. And they're going to give her that front row center seat because she manages payroll for everybody in the picture. Now, the problem was Elda could see the opportunity in buying and selling cottages in a rising market, but it might not be an acceptable thing for an indigenous woman to participate in back in the 50s and 60s. I consider the innovation, and I'm not sure of all the details, uh, to be that Isaac and her recognized each other's skills and found the right people to work with. Isaac was good at finding properties. Elder was good at dealing with the municipal governments, the paperwork, managing the money. It's that math thing again. Together and sometimes independently, they bought and sold cottages and lots on Georgian Bay. Alder was my Métis grandmother, and I remember her proudly showing me one of her cottages that we could use this summer, and she's going to sell it next summer for a profit. Uh, I'm proud to say I learned a lot about business from her, and I thank you for your time today. Thank you very much, Jack. And um, 
with that, um, I'm going to um, ask Celine to come up for the um, for the last uh, presentation on this panel. You may notice I've given up on the questions on poll everywhere. Uh,